So as you guys know, we talked this morning about those F words, and fun is where we're going to hear ways about how to foster independence and access the environment. With us today are Armando Ornelas, Austin Edenfield, Melissa McIntyre, Tanya Kari, and Dr. Jeff Rosenbluth. Welcome, guys. Yeah, thank you. So the green button would just forward. Your slides are right there. Okay. I guess I'm, I guess I'm going to start. Okay. <laughs> uh, let me take you back to uh, three years ago, uh, 2016, uh, there was a Coeur d'Alene Family Summit that was held in Garden Grove. Uh, at that time, I thought it would be a good opportunity to uh, uh, introduce the sport of power soccer. I had a table set up with some, some literature. I even brought a power soccer chair and the ball. And I had someone come up to me and ask me what I was selling. And I responded, I'm not selling anything. I'm promoting fun. So welcome to power soccer, the best sport on four wheels. The sport has come a long way from grassroots beginnings on a vacant basketball courts in France during the 1970s. In the early 1980s, Canada developed another form of power so chair football called motor soccer. It wasn't until 1988 that the sport arrived in the United States, started by a disabled sports program in Berkeley, California, using a larger ball than is what is used today. In 2006, the United States Power Soccer Association was formed. Uh, USPSA governs the sport of power soccer in the United States and promotes the sport on a national and international level. My son Kyle played power soccer for the first time in the spring of 2008, and he was hooked. He became elated with the challenge of learning a new sport and the potential of bonding with other individuals in wheelchairs. I saw an opportunity to support my son's aspirations and became involved in, in the fall of 2009, starting off as a certified referee, coaching, and now the director of the program over at Glendale Community College. Okay, so that's Welcome Power Soccer, okay. I'll go to the next screen. Okay, what, what is power soccer? Power soccer is the fastest growing competitive team sport for power wheelchair users. It combines its player skills with the chair, is played on an indoor uh, basketball court, four versus four with two 20 minute periods. Each team of four has three forwards and one goalie. It's an exciting and challenging game. Each team defends, attacks, spin kicks a 13-inch ball in an attempt to score goals. All right. To get off the sidelines and play a competitive sport is life-changing. Gives them an outlet and something to look forward to, a sense of belonging. They feel better about themselves and they become happier. Ignites a spark in them that gives them a new purpose. They're part of a team working together to accomplish a common goal. People who play power soccer think about themselves and their futures differently. They view themselves as athletes. They gain independence. They improve their self-esteem. They build self-confidence and start to see more possibilities in life and set new personal goals. For many, it marks the first time that they interact with people in the same situation as they are. They will develop lifelong friends, and their participation in sports can strike up conversations and connections with their non-disabled peers at school by having something in common through sports to discuss. The physical benefits of getting some exercise, the anticipation, and the butterflies before game competition. Power soccer is fun to play. Everyone deserves the chance to compete. The will to win, competitive challenge, teamwork, and the total spirit of an athlete is, is in no way limited or diminished because of a confinement to a wheelchair. As in all sports, win, lose, or draw, the thrill and joy is in playing the game. Okay. Power soccer is played in over 30 countries. 
in 2017, the World Cup was held in Florida. The t 10 countries that qualified were Argentina, Australia, Canada, Denmark, England, France, Ireland, Japan, Uruguay, and USA. USA came in second. The first two World Cups, USA were world champions. Yes. USA. Australia will, ho will host the next World Cup in 2021. There are over 75 teams in the United States. I coached a team out of Glendale, California, which is eight miles north of downtown LA. This photo here is a, is a photo of my, my youngest team. Uh, they range in the ages between nine to 14. Seven of the eight players have Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We love to have you attend one of our practices to see it firsthand. If there's not a team in your area, we'll help develop a, a team for you. Power Shock Development Group is dedicated to starting and growing the sport across the country. They did a clinic in Tulsa, Oklahoma last month, and their next stop is Charlotte, North Carolina on November 9th. We are growing the sport here in, in Southern California. We're branching out to Norco and also to Mecla. So we're gonna hit the Inland Empire here soon. I look forward to seeing you guys on the court. Thank you. How about that? All right, how's everyone doing? <laughs> I was uh, too busy jamming to Umbop in the back and now I realize I probably should use the bathroom earlier, it just hit me. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll be short and sweet, guys. Um, my name's Austin, I work uh, for a power wheelchair manufacturer called Quantum Rehab and I'm in the research and development department. Hang on, what am I doing? Sorry about that. Uh, big green button, gotcha. Oh yeah, sorry about that. Gr green button. There we go, ha. <laughs> All right, cool guys, so what we're gonna be going in a very, very brief overview. Um, I've, I've lectured for like two hours on each one of these topics, so I know we're doing expert meetups, so please come schedule one of those with me. We can dive uh, a lot deeper into this. Um, I also am in the uh, exhibit hall over there at the Quantum booth, come chat with me. Um, would love to answer any questions you guys have about any of these things. So we're basically gonna be going over kind of four things that are crucial to independence, right? One is mobility, two is communication, um, you know, three is really like accessing the environment, and then four is gaming and fun. Um, I've had the privilege of knowing Tiffany for a couple years, and uh, a lot of the, the boys I meet with Duchenne are very, very avid gamers, so we definitely want to cover that. So kind of a, a way to just start it out with is when you're considering how to be independent in those four categories, right? We w first want to take a look at the home um, in regards to mobility. How wide things are, do we need ramps, um, what are the heights of couches or tables? Um, and when specking out a power chair, usually a provider and a therapist like an OT or PT will kind of help you with these. They'll do a home assessment for you and make recommendations. Um, some other things you want to look at is, you know, automation and um, things of that nature can get expensive. Uh, and insurance doesn't always cover those things. So you kind of want to break it down into, you know, what activities of daily living do we do? What are the most commonly used appliances in the house? Are they light switches, fans, thermostats? You know, what are the things that, you know, maybe your son uses every single day that would like be crucial for them to be able to control themselves? Um, and then with gaming, like what types of games do we enjoy? Um, you know, there's a myriad of different genres out there and kind of different applicable technologies depending to what type of game you like. So this kind of goes in there um, a little bit. Uh, going over those four categories, um, a power wheelchair you'll notice is at the center. Uh, with technology we have available now and power chairs, um, of course it's made for being independently mobile. Um, we're launching a new chair January at Quantum that will be the narrowest power wheelchair available in North America. It's 20 and a half inches from wheel to wheel. So um, for those of you who, who have obviously children with Duchenne, it could be a great fit. Um, 
you know, it, it will allow them to basically get through any doorway. Um, it has really great climbing ability and allows you to get where you need to go um, without having to spend a lot of money renovating your home to accommodate a power chair, like widening the doorways or hallways. But with, with all the power chairs that come out nowadays, they have Bluetooth functionality built in, so you're able to do things like some types of gaming, um, home automation, and communication as well. So let's go over some of the different methodologies of access. So depending on what type of games you like, um, there are a lot of companies out there that make adaptive video game controllers. Um, there's a company called Voice Attack that will uh, let you use your voice to navigate computer games on a PC. Um, if you play competitive gaming with Steam or any of those, those types of things. Um, you can use head tracking, which is basically mounting an infrared camera to a computer and using um, a patient's head as kind of the mouse to control things and do clicks and control the character. Eye gaze is also another thing that's now available. Um, every Windows 10 computer running, basically if it was bought in the last couple years, it will have this stock. So you can buy an eye tracker for $149 and um, also utilize that for gaming. Yep. I just want to give a shout out because we have Microsoft Enable Team in the gaming lounge today and tomorrow, thanks to Austin connecting me with Ann. But don't shake your head now. And anyway, so they're actually demoing with our kiddos in the gaming lounge this weekend some of their eye gaze gaming. So I just had to share that. Absolutely. Okay. I'll, Microsoft I'll go back is amazing. <laughs> that was all you, though, getting, getting paired up. Oh, stop. Um, so, yeah, definitely check out that lounge. You can see some of the eye tracking technology up front and close. There's also a, a lot of companies that make video game controllers for one hand or with smaller, larger buttons or, you know, with different springs on the button packages that require a different level of force to activate the buttons. I'm not going to go over all of them here in 10 minutes, but come see me for the expert meetup. We can go over all of them or a combination of these technologies, kind of depending on how the progression of Duchenne is going um, for each individual. Um, with home automation, you know, we, we now have obviously voice assistants, um, which are really cool because not only can you use your voice to activate them, um, even in a lot of our, our clients we serve that have neuromuscular conditions that maybe, um, you know, struggle with speech intelligibility or dysarthria, um, Google has partnered with a number of nonprofits to make um, Google Assistant easier to understand for people that um, have speech impairments or dysarthria or a neurological condition. That way they can still be independent. Um, even if speech isn't an option, you know, with it's, it's still accessible through a tablet, through an app. Um, there's a, you can use Alexa, there's an app that you can download on your tablet. Um, and even if you don't have the use of fing you know, fingers or hands, you can use different modules on a joystick um, on a power chair like a joystick or a head control that can actually control your tablet and do clicks. So even if voice isn't an option to turn the lights on and off, you can actually use alternative drive controls like a head array or a chin mounted joystick or switch buttons to actually, through the wheelchair, interface with your iPad or um, other tablet device to navigate the lights on and off. And some different things to consider. I always tell families, you know, whether you rent or you own, uh, budget's always something to consider. With some of these automation technologies, um, most of them nowadays use Wi-Fi. So uh, there's Wi-Fi light bulbs that require very, very little work to install and get paired up with your favorite voice assistant that can also work with an app on a tablet or a phone. Um, the one thing to consider about the Wi-Fi devices is sometimes they tend to be more expensive, but they're a great option for those of you that are renting because you can just unscrew a bulb and put a new Wi-Fi light bulb in, pair it up with your voice assistant or through your wheelchair, and you're ready to go. You don't have to call an electrician to install anything special um, or anything of that nature. There's other technologies available like Z-Wave and Zigbee, which um, are a little bit less expensive than Wi-Fi, and they're a little bit more of a permanent solution. So instead of maybe replacing a bulb from time to time, you would actually purchase like a light switch that utilizes one of these different technologies and replace an existing light switch in your house and install this one. These light switches are maybe 27 or $28, and then you never have to worry about replacing a bulb. The switch has the technology you need. Um, again, come see me at the booth. I uh, would love to talk with you guys more. We only have a little bit of time, so we're going to be blazing through this. <laughs> 
Thank you. I figured in case I was boring or monotone, I at least have some pretty slick looking animations to keep you guys interested. It's good. Um, so with, with mobility, you know, the most important thing is what activities of daily living, you know, does each person do? Power seat functions play a role in that. Um, power adjustable seat height is something that is huge. That's basically a seat elevator that's mounted to a wheelchair, right? Um, so we at Quantum have one called Eye Level. Uh, really every power wheelchair manufacturer, most of them have some sort of power seat elevation function. So regardless of, you know, what chairs you're looking at with your therapist, your provider, this is an option that's available. Um, it can be difficult to get funded sometimes, but it's very, very important in being independent. Um, a seat elevator will allow you to elevate anywhere from 10 to 12 inches from a seated position while remaining in your power chair. So it's great so that children can interact with their peers at eye level when they're conversing. It's great for reaching things in and out of cabinets. It's great for going to a restaurant with the family and not being lower than everyone else and being able to pull right up to the table and be the same height. Um, you know, the, the other thing we want to check with mobility is the dimensions of the chair have to be conducive to basically navigating whatever environment you guys are in. You know, so that's why that home assessment is so critical and so important. You want to measure the doorways in the house. You want to measure the thresholds. You want to measure how tall the tables are, the furniture. So that way, you know, when someone is navigating with a wheelchair, it's, it's easy and it's conducive. Um, suspension and turn radius also play key factors in this. You know, something to work with your provider as well. There's a rear wheel drive power chair, a mid wheel drive power chair, a front wheel drive power chair. They all drive differently. Um, they all perform differently. Some of them have smaller turn radiuses. Some of them have wider turn radiuses. You know, you're going to want to consider where the drive wheel is mounted on the wheelchair, depending on what you like to do. If you're someone that likes to go outdoors a lot, drive around in grass, or um, if you have a lot of, you live in a city like Boston or an older city like New Orleans that maybe has um, uneven brick roads, cobblestone, things like that, you may want to look at a certain chair. Um, so work with your therapists and providers because where that drive wheel is mounted on that wheelchair really does make a world of difference. If you're primarily um, an indoor person and you are using your power chair mainly indoors, a mid-wheel drive might be something to consider because it has a really small turn radius um, and it's conducive to getting in and out and doing quick 180 degree turns. Um, other things to consider, you know, is speech generating devices. Again, a lot of these technologies that we just covered in the gaming slide are applicable to speech. Um, eye gaze, head tracking, using switch buttons, using direct selection um, via touchscreen. Uh, and these can also interface with the wheelchairs. Again, um, if you were to get a new wheelchair today, you know, more, more than likely, um, because we are dealing with uh, with children that grow, the wheelchair will need to grow with them. Um, you know, each, each person's progression is a little bit different. No two kids are the same. So it's important to get a wheelchair that grows with them, and your therapist will make sure you have that. So most of the wheelchairs today have um, Bluetooth built into the joysticks. So you can actually use the joystick to control a mouse um, on a computer. You can use a cursor on an Android tablet wirelessly hooked up through your wheelchair. Um, you can use switches. All of these things are cohesive to navigation. So if you have an iPad, for instance, um, you can mount it to the track system on a wheelchair. And then there you go. You can use your wheelchair joystick to access Alexa, access home automation apps, turn the lights on and off. You can play words with friends or other apps available just by using the joystick. Um, you can adjust the sensitivity. There's a world of, of all sorts of cool things you can do. So again, Please come talk to me later. I want to see all of your bright and shining eyes face to face so we can we can get you guys going. I'm serious. I'm here. Listen, I just want to be like, um, I come from a nonprofit background, so now I work at a for-profit company, so that's, that's cool. A little bit to get used to, but still here that the mission does not change, right? We're here as professionals in this industry to really be resources and to journey alongside of you guys, not just, oh, let me sell you a product and walk away. Um, let's get you the right product, number one, because they're not all exactly the same. No two kids are exactly the same. Their interests are different. The peer groups they interact with are different. So you know, that's why I'm saying please come talk to me because I want to listen to you guys and hear your stories. And whether you buy my product or not, I just want to make sure that you guys end up with a solution that works, and that's the most important thing. Um, so there's my contact information. 
Again, I do work for a power chair manufacturer called Quantum Rehab, um, but you can jot down my email if you have any questions about any of those things we mentioned, whether it's um, augmentative or alternative communication, whether it's how do I mount tablets to my wheelchair. It's, oh, we bought this Xbox, you know, adaptive video game controller. How can we mount that to the chair? Or, you know, our child needs help driving with something other than a joystick. We need an alternative way to steer, you know. I'm, I'm very well connected, and we can definitely make sure you guys get the resources um, that you guys need to be purposeful and productive. I think that's the number one cool thing about technology and how far it's come is, you know, we're able to really keep people being purposeful and productive and um, use technology as a way to restore independence. And I really hope and believe that one day there will be a medicinal cure. But I think until there is, technology can be that cure. Um, and that's, that's priceless. So pinkies up, y'all. That's all I got. <laughs> Perfect. So I'm going to break tradition and stand for a couple of reasons. Um, I'm a PT, and we never do well at sitting for extended periods of time. The next reason is I'm short, and I can only see all of my slides if I stand up. Plus, I have to make use of this wireless mic. Um, so I want to start off by saying I'm incredibly excited to be here. Um, and I get the opportunity to Intro somewhat introduce the people that are coming behind me. Um, they, the trails programs, what we're going to be talking about, I'm mostly going to talk about um, kind of the way we've brought in um, diagnosis such as Duchenne to the trails program. And so I want to start that off with, oh, they're blank again. Um, OK, perfect. So. I want to start that off by talking about one of my absolute very favorite subjects, which is me. <laughs> <laughs> I like you too. Yeah, right. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so no, all kidding aside, I just want to give a little bit of background of where I come from. So I'm at the University of Utah. The University of Utah does a ton of stuff. Um, within the University of Utah, I'm at a program called the Utah Program for Inherited Neuromuscular Disorders. That's a lot to say. We call it UPenn for short. Um, Part of my role there, or as our group there, we focus on multidisciplinary care, as well as translational research. And my role within that big group is as a physical therapist. As a physical therapist, I spend the majority of my time um, as a clinical evaluator on multiple trials, as well as in the clinic seeing patients. So really, what that leads into is where this collaboration started, where this came in that the two people that are going to speak next and us started working quite closely together. It started in a room somewhat like this. Um, this is the room where we see a lot of our study visits, and it's probably an environment that's pretty familiar to a lot of you here. Um, on the left, it's a PT mat, probably all very familiar with that. And then the other is the six-minute walk courts, which I think we all know the vein of that existence in a six-minute walk course. So what I realized as I was seeing patients and participants in this setting is that a large proportion of my life takes place out of this room. And a large proportion of our participants and patients' life takes place out of this room. And when I leave this room, I go and do things that I enjoy. And that leads in, if you ask me to describe myself, what are the things I enjoy? I'm a skier. I'm a mountain biker. I enjoy doing those things, and that's where I like to spend my time. And so that thought told me I had to think about it. And to be honest, if I'm giving this presentation somewhere else, this slide says, think about it. But this is the last room in the world I have to tell to think about barriers to access, and specifically barriers to access to recreation or their community. So I started thinking about it about me. Um, what barriers do I face when I try to go to the things I enjoy? I'll be honest, not too many. Time can be a barrier sometimes. What tools do I have available to address these barriers? I have a lot, right? I have a lot of tools to do that. If I need something new, I can just kind of wander into a store and ask people about it and, and go about it. And I started realizing that the patients I see on a day-to-day -day basis, these barriers are significantly larger than the ones I face today. Um, and so how do I, what options do we have to help address those for the patients we see? 
Um, when we're thinking about how to address those barriers, one thing we really have to keep in mind is a very simple graphic such as that. Is ind as independent mobility goes down, our need for equipment goes up. And the level of innovation within that equipment goes up. And if we can address the very two ends of the spectrum, we can like likely address kind of that whole continuum of things. And I started trying to think about, well, where, where's a program or something that can help us address this? And that brought up a collaboration between our group and a program called Trails. Let me say Trails is very near and dear to my heart. I volunteered for it before PT school. I met my husband volunteering with this program. I went to PT school. And then I started being able to bring in our neuromuscular population to trails. I have to give them a big thank you, because the thing that really started this is I emailed these lovely people next to me, and I said, I have an idea we need to meet. We met, and I said, I want to start taking kids with Duchenne out. And Jeff and Tanya looked at me and said, let's do it. And that started, that was about two years ago now, and we've had a lot of fun. So with that, I'm going to turn the rest of my time over to these humans next to me, and they'll be able to tell you about the program. Well, um, Melissa is one of my bosses and uh, <laughs> PT, and if she stands up, I know what I'm going to hear if I didn't stand up <laughs> and do this. But um, thank you, first of all, for inviting us here. We are super excited to be here. And it was very interesting to hear Austin earlier, too, how technology is changing lives and it's happening in recreation as well here. But uh, my name is Tanya Kari and I work for the TRAILS program at the University of Utah Health. And TRAILS stands for Technology, Recreation, Access, Independence, Lifestyles and Sports. And I listed all these without watching the screen, I promise. <laughs> but I, I hope that between Dr. Rosenbluth's and mine um, uh, talk, we can kind of give you an idea how we um, ended up working on all of these areas to make um, sports and recreation actually enjoyable and more independent for people. Um, so early on, this goes uh, back to 2005, 6, uh, before we started implementing programs, we, we made this big question, like who is participating and how are they doing it? And it's probably not a big surprise to you what we discovered. It's, it's very high functioning, um, low impairment level, people who don't need much help participating quite a bit. And there's quite a bit of equipment available for those people. But what about the rest? What is there for those who have high complex physical disability and high support needs. Um, this uh, led us to really think about our programming and, and made us design it to, so that we can provide appropriate support for all individuals with all skill and ability levels. And also, there wasn't equipment available, so someone has to tap into this. This has allowed um, for us to see a pretty significant increase in participation for individuals with complex physical disabilities. And I think uh, what has happened here is that we are kind of breaking sort of the norm that everyone we're getting used to, that certain people haven't participated, and if they did, it was more of a heavily assisted way of either skiing, someone skis you down the hill, or riding bike, someone rides the bike for you, or you are in a kayak or you are in a, in a canoe and someone is moving that boat for you. And, and if we have the capacity of moving away from this thinking, we will do it. And that's what we've been trying to, to focus on. And as a matter of fact, there is a um, significant increase in independent engagement in recreation. There's more people in charge of their own skiing, own sailing in this case. Here is a, um, uh, an example of a gentleman who is using a 
pretty heavy power wheelchair. How many power wheelchair users here have been stuck in mud or sand? <laughs> None? You have? Okay. So we recognize this fact and we try to build something around, uh, around that to get um, away from it. And here's an individual wheeling into a powered accessible docking system. Um, there is a powered accessible sailboat waiting for him and he can do this all independently. I'm not going to tell more about this because he's dying to tell about this. <laughs> So one really big important aspect is that our program model actively, actively involves rehabilitation professionals. This is where Melissa jumps in as well. So we are trying to design and implement everything using a team of professionals that can think through the whole session or the whole sport or the whole equipment. And that is the way we can, we can really address every aspect of the implementation. On the very left picture, you see two physical therapists and a water safety person setting someone up on a kayak. This person has C6 uh, complete spinal cord injury. We are doing it in the shade for a reason. Um, the other two pictures, uh, we have a physical therapist working on a, on a s ski seat. Actually, this is a seat from the Tetra ski that you see at our booth. Um, we've learned along the way that we can always order. You all know that all, you can only order the adaptive sports equipment in. That it's not available anywhere in the stores to just go and try out, right? Uh, it comes in and that's when you start to adapt things. It is not ready to go if you want to do this right. So we are actually uh, modifying the seat right there to make sure that we can put a real wheelchair seat and cushion in it. I mean, no one who is using a powered wheelchair should be sitting on just the foam cushion that these seats come with, right? We like to know our participants. In this case, uh, we like to know our skier before we go skiing. So early on, the process started with Melissa, who identified this four-year-old gentleman with muscular dystrophy to come uh, ski with us. Before we go skiing, we meet, and we have a simulator for our Tetra ski where we can practice what is that ski going to do when you go and ski it, actually. We have a way to print uh, different types of uh, joysticks, and we are testing which one is working the best in this case. And then we start to adapt the seat. You can imagine that it's not off the shelf order to, to um, order a seat for four year old. So, I mean, two by four, is that how that wood block is called? Um, <laughs> <laughs> it works, it doesn't always have to be fancy, but we can shorten the frame a little bit there. We know that it's very important that the legs hit an end there. And with different seating materials, we are able to build pretty comfortable seat for him. And then we go have fun. <laughs> I had big fun as a topic of this slide. Dr. Rosenbluth modified it, and now it's gone. But this is, <laughs> this is the result. So four-year-old skiing for the first time in his life, independently making those turns. And you see what he built for his steering wheel. The, um, the joystick is in the middle. It gave us an idea that maybe we should build an actual steering wheel. And. Uh, Look at the uh, dether between, it's actually Dr. Rosenbluth behind him. Um, it's fairly loose. He's there just for emergency braking and slowing down. He is doing this himself. No one else is doing those turns for him. So this is what I mean about independent participation. And I have to point out before I keep um, uh, to turn to Dr. Rosenbluth, I have to point out we have Casey Fenger standing 
right back there who has been a huge part of this. So Casey, thank you. You'll find him in the booth with us. The ski is there. We have a simulator for Tetra sale there. So come, come by and uh, come see. Come see this, this awesome ski. Thank you. Green button? Green button. Okay. I got so emotional talking about cake. All right. How's everyone doing? Hanging in there? Okay, good. Uh, the, uh, the last one here. So I'm Jeff Rosenbluth, and uh, I'm actually the spinal cord injury medical director at the University of Utah. And uh, I was a bit of a, a ski bum back before uh, medical school. Uh, I like technology. I'm a bit of a geek. And uh, I, uh, I, got, uh, I got to be a part of a ski program in the 80s uh, here in Southern California. You guys are familiar with Big Bear probably too. So. Um, I, I really got into it. I was really Im impressed with what, what sports did for folks that were going through all kinds of uh, issues and disabilities and, and complex uh, physical disability. Um, and somehow I, f I found my way through medical school and uh, be a doctor and medical director for spinal cord injury, but I really have come all the way full circle back to where I started because the, uh, the recreation piece, I'm, I'm convinced, is, is as important, if not more important, than anything I do in the hospital. So. Um, so this is, we, we live in a nice place and, and we'd love for you to visit. Don't move there because it's really nice, it's not crowded yet, but come visit. Um, <laughs> but uh, we have a really, really uh, exciting campus. So the University of Utah is really one of the fastest growing campuses in the country. Um, and, and, and one of the reasons is we're very compact. We've got all of the schools and colleges, the engineering colleges, computer science, the rehab folks are all in one place. And when you put a lot of people together that are idealistic and young and, and wanting to do something, right next to mountains like this and lakes uh, that are right there, you get some exciting things that are, that are happening that I want to I share with you today. Um, and with some of the technology we've developed, um, we've had some donors that have been really pretty excited about it, and we've had some folks that have given us enough funds uh, to actually build a new rehab hospital for us. So our re new rehab hospital is really built on the back of all of this new technology that you'll see some of uh, today. So we're really excited. That's coming online uh, in, in April of, of next year. So I'm going to share two things with you today, uh, two pieces of technology, and, and uh, you know, one of the reasons we got into this is, is lots of great equipment out there. There's just some amazing technology, um, but a lot of it does not serve a, a, a huge range of people, or the, the, the number of people that we'd like to see served, for sure. Um, so I'm going to share a couple things with you today. So this is um, a full sailboat uh, that's completely controlled with either just a joystick or, or even just breath control. Um, and you can see the gentleman that's actually uh, steering this boat and having a good time is actually using a little a straw system and a sip and puff system. But it's also, if you're familiar with these systems, it's not the traditional one that's on a wheelchair. Uh, the engineers at, at our school have actually uh, developed an entire kind of really complex interface that you can have with just your breath control. So you would think with kind of modern technology, you'd want to sort of speak and say, you know, sailboat, turn left. But that takes a long time to say that. If you could just do puff, sit, puff, or puff, puff, or hard puff, or soft, or do that in a combination, almost like Morse code, you can make a lot of complex things happen instantaneously. And that's what you need to do if you're going to do some advanced sports. If you're going to perform something at a very high level and do it independently, you need to have a really fast system. And that's what really some of these systems do. And you saw a little bit of that ski before. A lot of people look at that ski and it looks a little bit like a toy and you've got someone behind you. But I think Tanya was uh, mentioning to you before, I mean, this, this is the real deal. So this is real skis, electric actuators on both skis, and full independent control with either your mouth or just the, a joystick. And future interfaces to come. So the person in the back is really purely an emergency break. So I would hate if there was a catastrophic failure of just the electronics uh, that there would be a problem. But there's nothing you can do back there except sort of hang on for the ride. It's kind of the driver that's really in charge of it. Uh, and like you can see here, it's not just the bunny hills. We're on a really kind of upper intermediate, uh, almost advanced run in the powder. So this is up at Powder Mountain in, in Utah. So. And you'll recognize some of this technology because some of it's uh, uh, stolen really from the, the, the wheelchair industry, the power wheelchair industry. And so you've really got that nice lateral support that you might want. Um, a lot of people forget about a lot of the, the upper trunk support that you need and the head support that you need to really do these sports. You know, once, once you get out of just a chair in a normal flat environment and into water and snow and bumps and all kinds of things where you're really moving around, this becomes super important. And so over the years, we've worked this out. So I can guarantee that we can get people in there really snug so you're feeling super comfortable uh, no matter where people are at and, and really perform at a high level. You'll also see the little the boat that's on the side too has a little motor on the side there. So, you know, what's if you're a power wheelchair user, 
you know, what does kayaking look like? And I, I think it's powered. So this device is powered as almost a kayak and a sailboat as well. So you can kind of see a little close up too of how tight and, 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 uh, uh, and customized the seating is. So we can get the shoulders in there, the headrest, um, and everything just completely dialed in. Um, and we kind of go to that next level too. We really want to just look at any possible thing that's keeping us from performing at the highest, most independent level. So all of those are just joysticks that we 3D print. Um, and we actually can 3D scan people's hands, people's wrists, and really build for really like $12, basically, uh, a custom really control interface for you so that you can perform at the highest level. Again, a lot of the joystick controllers that folks have on their chairs, they're fine for every day, but when you start bouncing around and all that, you really start to need to get something custom, and that's what we've done. Um, we started with just this breathing interface and a joystick interface, but you can even see on the bottom left there, um, that's, a, that's a, EM, a wireless EMG switch. So it really just picks up a little bit of muscle activity uh, and can convert that to, to, to controlling systems too. So you can almost think about you know, putting, I don't know, two, three, four, ten of these you know, anywhere that you want where you have a really good solid muscle and then convert that into something incredibly useful. So if I wanted my right first toe to be the right turn on a ski, and if I wanted my left shoulder to be the left turn, I mean, any of that is possible, and that's what really what we're working on right now. So just so you see what's going on, because it's kind of hard to tell in those pictures, but uh, electric actuators, these are like submarine actuators that, that actually move the planes on submarines. Um, and so you can kind of see how those move back and forth and independently. And then just with the breathing system, you've got full control. There's a little servo motor on the back. You've got full control of the rudder. And these are just not a lot of big breathing, just like little sup, sips and puffs. And even if you don't necessarily use a sip and puff device, sometimes using the joystick and the sip and puff can give you really, really fast performance. And, and again, that's what it's about, because we're really, we're really trying to do a lot of things at the same time. You're trying to control the motor, which has multiple speeds up and multiple speeds down and reverse. And you're trying to control the, uh, the sailing system, the rudder, all at the same time, which you can do very successfully. And I'll show you this in a little bit. Um, so motor system, forward, reverse, if you're trying to get out of a complex uh, marina and, and there's no wind yet, you don't have to have the sail out, just do this. Uh, as soon as you're in the boat, you're out there and you're cruising on your own. Um, and also the other thing we thought that was pretty interesting is, I don't know, I mean, I'd like to get out skiing more. There's a lot of people that don't ski at all or maybe they get out one time a year. Um, but, but one thing that we can do is we can actually take a simulated environment and do the exact sport in a simulation. So how many people play games here? A lot, okay. So really, uh, taking, the, taking this back to a gaming environment, and this is a really sophisticated simulator. It really is, feels the same doing the simulator as it does with the real sport. All the control systems are the same, and once you actually get things dialed in the way that you want it, we can take all of the settings that you like and put them in the real device. So that's the boat simulator. And you've got a ski simulator too. So you can choose which device, the sip and puff, the joystick, you assign sips and puffs and control systems. Any custom interface that you can make up that you think is the fastest for you, that's what we're going to do. We also use Google Earth, so we actually map the exact ski run that you're going to ski in real life, and it's actually the ski run that you're going to do actually in the simulation. And you get a little feedback. You can kind of see the skis moving. It's a little bit hard to know what the skis are doing under you, so we can give you a little visual feedback for that. And here's real life. So we're doing about eight knots, uh, like three inches off the water. Uh, and this is a gentleman that I take care of uh, with a spinal cord injury. And uh, he's actually on a ventilator. So we're just on the side kicking back with drinks, and he's taking us for a sail. There's really... Um, Nothing at all that we're really doing except having a great time. So he's in charge. That's how the boat looks out there, too. It's a trimaran, so it's really super stable. Um, even if the wind blows super hard, it'll just bend the mast and dump the wind, so it really isn't uh, something that's ever flipped, ever. Um, people, of course, have life jackets, and we have lots of safety and backup, uh, but it's, it's incredible. We haven't had anyone yet that has ever come to us that isn't able to do this independently. Uh, and I think you saw it really uh, from the back before, but I'll kind of show you an, another view. Um, and uh, this, is, this is one of your yep. patients, right? Yep. Yep. 
Great. So we're, uh, and this is up at uh, Powder Mountain. And you can kind of see, I mean, I, I think I am in the back, and I really am just trying to keep up. You know, you can't really see what's happening in front of you with your skier, so you're just always guessing, are they going to go left, are they going to go right? So sometimes you see me kind of not knowing what to do. And so I think I just, Casey actually told me this today, but do you see the person who fell in the back? Do you know who that is? That's his dad. <laughs> His family had a really hard time keeping up with us. <laughs> um, so this is a gentleman. Uh, the only thing that he really, he, he has a spinal cord injury as well. Uh, he can move his head and, and his neck weakly. You can actually see his head moving around a little bit. But he's actually using just the mouth control. And so all of those turns, all of those really tight turns and all those G-forces are all created by him. He, and he's particularly good and we can go anywhere. This is at Deer Valley in Utah. What is this thing? So it wasn't enough, really, for us uh, to just design the boat. I still thought it was a real pain you know, to get people from chairs into oh, yeah. boats. And there's all that mud and the muck that you saw before in Tanya's picture. And so this uh, looks just like a trailer. You're wondering why it's in the water. You know, but it does open up. And it becomes a 30 by 8 foot wheelchair accessible boat. And what's on the back of that? What's in the back of that thing? That's the sailboat. So it's, like, it's got like a little toy hauler ramp. So we can just pull that up with a little winch. No one has to really break their backs. And then in the shade, we can just comfortably get in there and, uh, and just uh, get set up properly. It's a whole solar electric boat. And the boat itself, the 30-foot boat, is controlled by that same control scheme for the ski and for the, and for the sailboat. So any one of our, our participants can actually drive that thing as well. Um, and a lift on the side because it always bothered me, again, all that lifting. So that whole lift brings the kayak into the boat. You make it level with your wheelchair or downhill a little bit to make it a really super easy transfer. And again, where else can you go where you can get out of your power chair, into a boat, go across the lake, go to a beach, get out of the boat, and go to another beach? You can't really do it. But this is what, something where we can do, and we can do it very easily. Um, so we're calling this whole initiative uh, Tetra Adapt. And we actually have um, raised a pretty good amount of money to make some of these skis and these boats. And the skis are the first devices that have made it really to the marketplace, which is a, not a commercial marketplace, but a nonprofit world. Um, and those skis are, went out across the United States last year. This year, there's going to be um, a, a Tetra ski instructor from the University of Utah who's going to be stationed in the East Coast, one in the Rockies, one in Southern California, serving Mountain High, Snow Valley, and Big Bear, and one up in Northern California. So we're paying for the instructor, so the lesson should be free or, some, or, or a nominal charge. And uh, you guys are welcome to, to check it out. So on the tetraadapt.us website, we'll keep a calendar of where the ski is. And you'll also get to see where, where all of the other devices are in the development and where they'll be. So we'll be just churning these things out over time. And I didn't have enough time today, but I've got a list of at least six more devices. And if you want to drop us a note on tetraadapt.us about other things that you think we should be working on, we'd be happy to do it. There's lots of eager uh, engineers and computer scientists. So at the end of the day, our, our new motto is to control everything that we want to control with anything that we have, and to do it with high performance and, and independence, and most of all, a lot of fun. So with that, I leave you with my gratuitous drone shot, uh, and uh, thank you so much. Appreciate it. <laughs> wow, you guys. You, you certainly showed us how to have fun. Thank you. It was fabulous. So now we have time to chat. Am I Jennifer, Doug? Are you here? Oh, they're here. They have the catch boxes around. So who has a question? Oh, Hawkin does. Come on, Jen. He's up front. Is he? Hustle, hustle. Let's go. Move it, move it, move it. Come on. on the lay. <laughs> here she comes. No, no. You're, on, you're working. He's enjoying. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming and speaking with us. I really like what you were talking about with ad adaptable skiing and such. And I was curious if you've looked into doing like adaptable scuba diving or something along those lines and you know other things that you might be working on for those people that might want to do other things apart from skiing and boating and such. Yeah. 
Uh, name the sport, and I think we've thought about it. So off-road devices, um, a completely waterproof wheelchair that goes from the beach all the way into the water. Uh, we are doing uh, shooting, so I mean literally guns that are, are controlled, uh, easy to kind of aim. Um, the scuba we do, but we haven't um, adapted like a powered uh, device to kind of move through the water yet. But I actually like that idea, and I, we'll, we'll do some more thinking about it. Were there other sports you were thinking about? Um. Oh, you hit a lot of them, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, I didn't show the video, too, but we actually have uh, Tanya's uh, favorite sport and the only true skiing that, that she says is, is uh, Nordic skiing. So we actually have a power assist Nordic ski. So there's nothing harder than Nordic skiing. I, I, I think no one would argue with that. But we actually have a little, like, a tank tread behind it. So we'd like to get anyone out on the snow just on any kind of trail in a, in a power assisted environment. That was the only way to get him to do real skiing. <laughs> <laughs> I have to wear a one piece, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Who else has a question? Up, oh, right here. Well, um, what about something to keep your power chair from getting stuck in the sand and the mud? <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back to the basics, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think about our little boy is in Cub Scouts, and it's a hard thing sometimes to mm -hmm. get around. We just went camping a couple of weeks ago, and he got caught in gravel. He got caught in yeah. sand. So what about something for that? Can I take Austin, that one? Austin, yep, jump in. Cool. That tape, weird. You're on. Yeah, you're okay, cool. Came out. Tape is on the beard. Uh, that that's a great question, and I think that's an, an, an important question that we need to discuss um, because. Even today, and I mean, I work for a power wheelchair manufacturer uh, in an R&D department, there really isn't a good power chair on the market that can traverse all those terrains you just mentioned, especially gravel. Um, I remember traveling to several folks in the south that had all gravel driveways, and they had to load their son up in a van, and it was incredibly, incredibly difficult. So uh, we want to address that at Quantum. One of the things that we've done this year, just uh, in the past six months since I've been there, is... Um, we love that feedback, and we've actually, we're doing end user roundtables. So rather than just hearing from the therapists and clinicians that prescribe our products, more importantly, you know, they're important, of course, but we want to hear from the people that actually use the products every day. Uh, so we just did one at Boston at the Abilities Expo. Um, we had 19 people there, all with varying conditions uh, from SMA to uh, Duchenne to a complete, you know, C3 spinal cord injury. Uh, and I asked them, I said, guys, can you send me pictures of, you know, maybe your favorite places, your favorite parks, your favorite restaurants, anywhere that is difficult to navigate currently in a wheelchair? Um, because as we develop prototypes uh, in, in new wheelchairs, we actually want to take them out to terrains like that and try them while they're in a prototype stage, because uh, that's really the best time to make changes. So I guess to answer your question is, uh, there's not really one available that meets my standard, which would be your standard of um, accessibility with navigating those terrains, but we are working on it, and I think you should see something here in, um, in the next few years. So keep those coming, and if you took down my email address, if you know you have your house or something, and you'd love to send me pictures or just details, um, you know we can get our engineers in the field and have them in a similar environment to replicate that for future designs. Questions. I have a question. Oh, okay, and then come down. Oh, you got, for, go ahead, Douglas. Just real quick for Dr. Rosenbluth. Um, are there any um, temperature restrictions or cold? Hi. Oh. Uh, any, with the <laughs> it's skis, hard to see you back there. Um, sorry, with the skis, any temperature or cold restrictions that you found where the actuators will, you know, not work, they'll freeze up or collect ice or anything like that? No, we, we haven't had any problems, and we've tested it down to below zero for eight hours. The battery life is all day, and we haven't had any problems. And we're starting to use uh, heated clothing also, so heated gloves, scarves, hats, um, and, and jackets as well, because we, we, we know thermoregulation is an issue. We, we can actually, in the future, not yet, we'll plug those into our battery pack so we can power those heated systems for clothing all day as well. But the actuators have been great. Four years of running the actuators, we haven't had one actuator problem from the cold. My question kind of went back to what we were just talking about on the last one, and this is just me looking at a chair, is uh, why aren't there more, I guess maybe uh, like a track mounted, some kind of track instead of the wheels for situations like that? 
you know, like a yeah. tread. Uh, yeah, that's an that's an outstanding question, and uh, the real answer to that is funding. Yes. Um, does it really? Does it cost that much more to put a track, a modified track system on a chair as opposed to a wheel? So it's not really necessarily how much it costs us as a manufacturer to do. It's what the FDA views as being medically necessary for people, mm -hmm. and it's what your insurance will reimburse us for. Um, about 68% of private insurance is currently follow Medicare guidelines. So uh, I don't know if you're familiar with CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. They have something called the PDAC, the Pricing Data Analysis Coordinator, that basically sets reimbursement for different pieces of equipment. They're primarily concerned with use in the home. Um, so there's a whole range of categories of wheelchairs, um, like Group 4 and, and other wheelchairs, that is really, really difficult, if not non-existent, to get funding for. And it's not necessarily because we don't want to as manufacturers or that it's cost prohibitive for us. It's just that the FDA prohibits us from selling directly to consumers. Mm -hmm. So we have to use um, suppliers and resellers and durable medical equipment suppliers. And they're bound basically by what is the insurance going to reimburse. The insurance is only going to reimburse basically what Medicare says they will, will or won't reimburse. And they're primarily concerned with use in the home. So that's the battle we're up against. Um, and we are trying as a company to say, okay, well, you know, a group three power chair, right? A group three power chair is, is what a lot of um, people with Duchenne as, as they progress and become teenagers and stuff is what they will qualify for. So there's minimum requirements for how tall of a threshold the chair can climb, what the battery um, range should be, as well as the speed of the motor package. Um, you know, as we, we give you faster speeds than what Medicare pays for. So we're, we're trying to look at things that we can bake into the chair that we can essentially kind of like lose money on <laughs> while trying to make money elsewhere. But the real answer to your question as far as why there isn't like a tank track or a tank tread that's easily affordable and readily available, uh, the real answer to that is funding in the medical system. And I hate to feel like that's a cop-out answer, but we can definitely go more in, in depth about it later yeah. if you'd like. There, there is... Um there is one product, the Action Track Chair, that's, that's on, on the market. There's Track Fab as well. Yeah, because we, we had one last summer, so there's um, at least one manufacturer that's putting them out regularly and someone else that's doing it sort of custom. But there's, a, there's been a couple of attempts at it. Yeah, it just seems like it would solve a lot more problems. You know, people think like a tank track that's really big, but you can do them really narrow, you know, and they're not big and bulky like that that could allow somebody to go over more terrain, do s stairs, like a lower incline stair or something like that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Agreed. That's a fantastic idea. And to his point, there is um, two companies out there. One of them is in Pennsylvania where I'm at called TrackFab. And again, you can purchase these chairs. They are available. But the thing is, it's a cash purchase out of pocket and it's not covered by insurance. So we're trying to lobby the government. I know us and even our competitors are all trying to lobby the government to change funding so that we can do a little bit more of that where insurance will cover it. All right, we have time for a couple more, one more question back. Who has, oh, right here's right Jen. Right. Yeah. So we live um, up in. Sorry. Uh, I have a question. So we oh. actually, oh, oh. sorry. Uh, go ahead. So we've actually used, we do the ski every year, um, and he sits in the, we haven't used that cool new one, though. Um, he sits in a bucket. And it's really difficult to get him in and out. Um, he's about 140 pounds. And he has to use the restroom um, all the time. <laughs> so getting him in and out of that, it's low and kind of hard. So I just wondered how people did that. Yeah, sure. So yeah, it is a little bit of a challenge. We can choose ski runs where we make a lot of passes back by the lodge, um, and that's helpful. Um, in terms of just comfort, um, the chairs are pretty comfortable, and we use power uh, wheelchair seating systems on there, too, uh, that are pretty comfortable. Uh, but we, we can do some things on, like all of us do on the side of the ski run <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> if, if we need to. Um, we'll do whatever it takes. Uh, to make it happen. So we've, we've had that issue before, but we've, we've really made it work, just try to make it fun. And uh, usually we're out with family, too, that can help us a little bit, and it's, it hasn't been too much of a problem. 
Okay, well I just wondered what other people do. I mean, do they put them in a diaper? Like, do they use a kind of bag or, I don't really know, um, so that he can go when he needs to? Sorry, is that kind of a weird question, but that's our biggest challenge probably. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think we could, we could definitely find a workaround. Okay. There's, there's actually, uh, I, I don't know if you use catheters or not, there's a really cool product out in the market uh, made by a company called Richardson Products and it's called the Hydro Flush. So it allows basically people you know, that, that store catheter bags or something underneath their pant leg, it's just a button that they press and it uh, empties the bag anywhere you want discreetly. That's pretty neat. Mm -hmm. so that's there's pretty also neat. a condom catheter too that it, it works like that. I know <laughs> it's <so> awkward. <laughs> But I know Dr. Wagner, she's not around now, but she has referenced that too. So that's just another option. You got to go, you just go. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. I kind of need one now maybe. No. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this is all really cool. This it wouldn't work on me. Our kid is right. constantly getting stuck in the mud. I'm constantly making hawk and laugh. Stuck everywhere. So, <laughs> Let's you know, go get stuck in the snow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, that was fantastic. Thank you for sharing everything. It was lots of fun.